Section 3 of The Genealogy of Morals by Friedrich Nietzsche, translated by Horace B. Samuel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Geoffrey Church. Second Essay Guilt, Banned Conscience, and the Like. Part 1. 1. The breeding of an animal that can promise. Is not this just the very paradox of a task which nature has set itself in regard to man? Is not this the very problem of man? The fact that this problem has been to a great extent solved must appear all the more phenomenal to one who can estimate at its full value that force of forgetfulness which works in opposition to it. Forgetfulness is no mere vis inertiae, as the superficial believes. Rather, it is a power responsible for the fact that what we have lived, experienced, taken into ourselves, no more enters into consciousness during the process of digestion, and might be called psychic absorption, than all the whole manifold process by which our physical nutrition, the so-called incorporation, is carried on. The temporary shutting of the doors and windows of consciousness, the relief from the clamant alarums and excursions with which our subconscious world of servant organs works in mutual cooperation and antagonism, a little quietude, a little tabula rasa of the consciousness, so as to make room again for the new, and above all for the more noble functions and functionaries, room for government, foresight, predetermination, for our organism is on an oligarchic model, this is the utility, as I have said, of the active forgetfulness, which is a very sentinel and nurse of psychic order, repose, etiquette. And this shows at once why it is that there can exist no happiness, no gladness, no hope, no pride, no real present without forgetfulness. The man in whom this preventative apparatus is damaged and discarded is to be compared to a dyspeptic, and it is something more than a comparison. He can get rid of nothing. But this very animal who finds it necessary to be forgetful, in whom, in fact, forgetfulness re represents a force and a form of robust health, has reared for himself an opposition power, a memory, with whose help forgetfulness is, in certain instances, kept in check, in the cases, namely, where promises have to be made, so that it is by no means a mere passive inability to get rid of a once indented impression, not merely the indigestion occasioned by a once pledged word which one cannot dispose of but an active refusal to get rid of it a continuing and a wish to continue what had once been willed an actual memory of the will so that between the original i will i shall do and the actual discharge of the will its act we can easily interpose a world of new strange phenomena circumstances veritable volitions without snapping of this long chain of the will. But what is the underlying hypothesis of all this? How thoroughly, in order to be able to regulate the future in this way, must man have first learned to distinguish between necessitated and accidental phenomena, to think causally, to see the distant as present and to anticipate it, to fix with certainty what is the end and what is the means to that end, above all to reckon, to have power to calculate, how thoroughly must man have first become calculable, disciplined, necessitated even for himself and his own conception of himself, that, like a man entering a promise, he could guarantee himself as a future. 2. This is simply the long history of the origin of responsibility. That task of breeding an animal which can make promises includes, as we have already grasped, as its condition and preliminary, the more immediate task of first making man to a certain extent necessitated, uniform, like among his like, regular and consequently calculable. The immense work of what I have called morality of custom, compare Dawn of Day, Aphorisms 9, 14, and 16, the actual work of man on himself during the longest period of the human race, his whole prehistoric work, find its meaning its great justification, in spite of all its innate hardness, despotism, stupidity, and idiocy. In this fact, man, with the help of the morality of customs and of social straight waistcoats, was made genuinely calculable. If, however, we place ourselves at the end of this colossal process, at the point where the tree finally matures its fruits, 
when society and its morality of custom finally bring to light that to which it was only the means, then do we find as the ripest fruit on its tree the sovereign individual that resembles only himself, that has got loose from the morality of custom, the autonomous super-moral individual, for autonomous and moral are mutually exclusive terms, in short, the man of the personal, long, and independent will, competent to promise, and we find in him a proud consciousness, vibrating in every fiber, of what has been at last achieved and become vivified in him, a genuine consciousness of power and freedom, a feeling of human perfection in general. And this man who has grown to freedom, who is really competent to promise, this lord of the free will, this sovereign, how is it possible for him not to know how great is his superiority over everything incapable of binding itself by promises, or of being its own security? How great is the trust, the awe, the reverence that he awakes? He deserves all three, not to know that with this mastery over himself he is necessarily also given to mastery over circumstances, over nature, over all creatures with shorter wills, less reliable characters. The free man, the owner of a long, unbreakable will, finds in this possession his standard of value. Looking out from himself upon the others he honors, or he despises, and just as necessarily as he honors his peers, the strong and the reliable, those who can bind themselves by promises, that is, every one who promises like a sovereign, with difficulty, rarely and slowly, who is sparing with his trusts, but confers honor by the very fact of trusting, who gives his word as something that can be relied on, because he knows himself strong enough to keep it even in the teeth of disasters, even in the teeth of fate. So, with equal necessity, will he have the heel of his foot ready for the lean and empty jackasses, who promise when they have no business to do so, and his rod of chastisement ready for the liar, who already breaks his word at the very minute when it is on his lips. The proud knowledge of the extraordinary privilege of responsibility, the consciousness of this rare freedom, of this power over himself and over fate, has sunk right down to his innermost depths, and has become an instinct, a dominating instinct. What name will he give to it, to this dominating instinct, if he needs to have a word for it. But there is no doubt about it. The sovereign man calls it his conscience. 3. His conscience? One apprehends at once that the idea conscience, which is here seen in its supreme manifestation, supreme in fact to almost the point of strangeness, should already have behind it a long history and evolution. The ability to guarantee oneself with all due pride, and also at the same time to say yes to oneself, that is, as has been said, a ripe fruit, but also a late fruit. How long must needs this fruit hang sour and bitter on the tree? And for an even longer period there was not a glimpse of such a fruit to be had. No one had taken it upon himself to promise it, although everything on the tree was quite ready for it, and everything was maturing for that very consummation. How is a memory to be made for the man-animal? How is an impression to be so deeply fixed upon this ephemeral understanding, half dense and half silly, upon this incarnate forgetfulness, that it will be permanently present? As one may imagine, this primeval problem was not solved by exactly gentle answers and gentle means. Perhaps there is nothing more awful and more sinister in the early history of man than his system of mnemonics something is burnt in so as to remain in his memory only that which never stops hurting remains in his memory this is an axiom of the oldest unfortunately also the longest psychology in the world it might even be said that wherever solemnity seriousness mystery and gloomy colors are now found in the life of the men and the nations of the world there is some survival of that horror which was once the universal concomitant of all promises, pledges, and obligations. The past, the past with all its length, depth, and hardness, wafts to us its breath and bubbles up in us again when we become serious. When man thinks it necessary to make for himself a memory, he never accomplishes it without blood, tortures, and sacrifices. The most dreadful sacrifices and forfeitures, among them the sacrifice of the firstborn, 
the most loathsome mutilation, for instance, castration, the most cruel rituals of all the religious cults, for all religions are at really bottom systems of cruelty. All these things originate from that instinct which found in pain its most potent mnemonic. In a certain sense, the whole of asceticism is to be ascribed to this. Certain ideas have got to be made inextinguishable, omnipresent, fixed, with the object of hypnotizing the whole nervous and intellectual system through these fixed ideas. And the ascetic methods and modes of life are the means of freeing those ideas from the competition of all other ideas so as to make them unforgettable. The worse memory man has, the ghastlier the signs presented by his customs. The severity of the penal laws affords in particular a gauge of the extent of man's difficulty in conquering forgetfulness and in keeping with a few primal postulates of social intercourse ever present to the minds of those who are the slaves of every momentary emotion and every momentary desire we germans do certainly not regard ourselves as a especially cruel and hard-hearted nation still less as an especially casual and happy-go-lucky one but one has only to look at our old penal ordinances in order to realize what a lot of trouble it takes in the world to evolve a nation of thinkers I mean, the European nation, which exhibits at this very day the maximum of reliability, seriousness, bad taste, and positiveness, which has on the strength of these qualities a right to train every kind of European Mandarin. These Germans employ terrible means to make for themselves a memory, to enable them to master the rooted plebeian instincts and the brutal crudity of those instincts. Think of the old German punishments, for instance, stoning, as far back as the legend, the millstone falls on the head of the guilty man. Breaking on the wheel, the most original invention and specialty of the German genius in the sphere of punishment. Dart throwing, tearing or trampling by horses, quartering, boiling the criminal in oil or wine still prevalent in the 14th and 15th centuries. The highly popular flaying, slicing into strips, cutting the flesh out of the breast, Think also of the evildoer being besmeared with honey and then exposed to the flies in a blazing sun. It was by the help of such images and precedents that man eventually kept it in his memory five or six I will nots, with regard to which he had already given his promise, so as to be able to enjoy the advantages of society. And verily with the help of this kind of memory man eventually attained reason. Alas! reason seriousness mastery over the emotions all these gloomy dismal things which are called reflection all these privileges and pageantries of humanity how dear is the price that they have exacted how much blood and cruelty is the foundation of all good things four but how is it that the other melancholy object the consciousness of sin the whole bad conscience came into the world and it is here that we turn back to our genealogists of morals for the second time i say or have i not said it yet that they are worth nothing just their own five spans long limited modern experience no knowledge of the past and no wish to know it still less a historic instinct a power of second sight which is what is really required in this case and despite this to go in for the history of morals it stands to reason that this must needs produce results which are removed from the truth by something more than a respectful distance. Have these current genealogists of morals ever allowed themselves to have even the vaguest notion, for instance, that the cardinal moral idea of ought originates from the very material idea of O, or that punishment, developed as a retaliation absolutely independently of any preliminary hypothesis of the freedom or determination of the will, and this to such an extent that a high degree of civilization was always first necessary for the animal man to begin to make those much more primitive distinctions of intentional, negligent, accidental, responsible, and their contraries, and apply them in the assessing of punishment. That idea, the wrongdoer, deserves punishment because he might have acted otherwise, in spite of the fact that it is nowadays so cheap, obvious, natural, and inevitable, that it has had to serve as an illustration of the way in which the sentiment of justice appeared on earth, is in point of fact an exceedingly late and even refined form of human judgment and inference. The placing of this idea back at the beginning of the world is simply a clumsy violation of the principles of primitive psychology. 
throughout the longest period of human history, punishment was never based on the responsibility of the evildoer for his action, and was consequently not based on the hypothesis that only the guilty should be punished. On the contrary, punishment was inflicted in those days for the same reason that parents punish their children even nowadays, out of anger at an injury that they have suffered, an anger which vents itself mechanically on the author of the injury. But this anger is kept in bounds and modified through the idea that every injury has somewhere or other its equivalent price, and can really be paid off, even though it be by means of pain to the author. Whence it is that this ancient, deep-rooted, and now perhaps ineradicable idea has drawn its strength, this idea of an equivalency between injury and pain. I have already revealed its origin, in the contractual relationship between creditor and ower, that is, as old as the existence of legal rights at all, and in its turn points back to the primary forms of purchase, sale, barter, and trade. 5. The realization of these contractual relations excites, of course, as would be already expected from our previous observations, a great deal of suspicion and opposition towards the primitive society which made or sanctioned them. In this society, promises will be made. In this society, the object is to provide the promiser with a memory. In this society, so we may suspect, there will be full scope for hardness, cruelty, and pain. The ower, in order to induce credit in his promise of repayment, in order to give a guarantee of the earnestness and sanctity of his promise, in order to drill into his conscience the duty, the solemn duty of repayment, will, by virtue of a contract with his creditor, to meet the contingency of his not paying, pledge something that he still possesses, something that he still has in his power, for instance, his life or his wife, or his freedom or his body, or under certain religious conditions, even his salvation, his soul's welfare, even his peace in the grave. So in Egypt, where the corpse of the ower found even in the grave no rest from the creditor, of course, from the Egyptian standpoint, this peace was a matter of particular importance. But especially has the creditor the power of inflicting on the body of the ower all kinds of pain and torture. The power, for instance, of cutting off from it an amount that appeared proportionate to the greatness of the debt. This point of view resulted in the universal prevalence at an early date of precise schemes of valuation, frequently horrible in the minuteness and meticulosity of their application, legally sanctioned schemes of valuation for individual limbs and parts of the body. I consider it as already a progress, as a proof of a free or less petty and more Roman conception of law, when the Roman Code of the Twelve Tables decreed that it was immaterial how much or how little the creditors in such a contingency cut off. Si plus minusve secerunt ne fraude esto. Let us make the logic of the whole of this equalization process clear. It is strange enough. The equivalence consists in this. Instead of an advantage directly compensatory to, of his injury, that is, instead of an equalization in money, lands, or some kind of chattel, the creditor is granted by way of repayment and compensation a certain sensation of satisfaction, the satisfaction of being able to vent without any trouble his power on one who is powerless, the delight de faire le mal pour le plaisir de la faire, the joy in sheer violence, and this joy will be relished in proportion to the lowness and humbleness of the creditor in the social scale, and is quite apt to have the effect of the most delicious dainty, and even seem the foretaste of a higher social position. Thanks to the punishment of the ower, the creditor participates in the rights of the masters. At last he too, for once in a way, attains the edifying consciousness of being able to despise and ill-treat a creature as an inferior, or at any rate of seeing him being despised and ill-treated, in case the actual power of punishment, the administration of punishment, has already become transferred to the authorities. The compensation consequently consists in a claim on cruelty and a right to draw thereon. 6. It is then in this sphere of the law of contract that we find the cradle of the whole moral world of the ideas of guilt, conscience, duty, the sacredness of duty, their commencement, like the commencement of all great things in the world, is thoroughly and continuously saturated with blood. And should we not add that this world has never really lost a certain savor of blood and torture, not even in old Kant, the categorical imperative reeks of cruelty, 
it was in this sphere likewise that there first became formed that sinister and perhaps now indissoluble association of the ideas of guilt and suffering to put the question yet again why can suffering be a compensation for owing because the infliction of suffering produces the highest degree of happiness because the injured party will get in exchange for his loss including his vexation at his loss an extraordinary counter pleasure the infliction of suffering a real feast something that as i have said was all the more appreciated the greater the paradox created by the rank and social status of the creditor these observations are purely conjectural for apart from the painful nature of the task it is hard to plumb such profound depths the clumsy introduction of the idea of revenge as a connecting link simply hides and obscures the view instead of rendering it clearer revenge itself simply leads back again to the identical problem how can the infliction of suffering be a satisfaction in my opinion it is repugnant to the delicacy and still more to the hypocrisy of tame domestic animals that is modern men that is ourselves to realize with all their energy the extent to which cruelty constituted the great joy and delight of ancient man was an ingredient which seasoned nearly all his pleasures and conversely the extent of the naivete and innocence with which he manifested his need for cruelty when he actually made as a matter of principle disinterested malice or to use spinoza's expression the sympathia malevolens into a normal characteristic of man as consequently something to which the conscience says a hearty yes the more profound observer has perhaps already had sufficient opportunity for noticing this most ancient and radical joy and delight of mankind in beyond good and evil aphorism one eighty eight and even earlier in the dawn of day aphorisms eighteen seventy seven one thirteen i have cautiously indicated the continually growing spiritualization and deification of cruelty which pervades the whole history of the higher civilization and in the larger sense even constitutes it at any rate the time is not so long past when it was impossible to conceive of royal weddings and national festivals on a grand scale without executions tortures or perhaps an auto de fe or similarly to conceive of an aristocratic household without a creature to serve a butt for the cruel and malicious baiting of the inmates the reader will perhaps remember don quixote at the court of the duchess we read nowadays the whole of don quixote with a bitter taste in our mouth almost with a sensation of torture a fact which would appear very strange and very incomprehensible to the author and his contemporaries they read it with the best conscience in the world as the gayest of books they almost died with laughing at it the sight of suffering does one good the infliction of suffering does one more good that is a hard maxim but none the less a fundamental maxim old powerful and human all too human one moreover to which perhaps even the apes as well would subscribe for it is said that in inventing bizarre cruelties they are giving abundant proof to their future humanity to which as it were they are playing the prelude without cruelty no feast so teaches the oldest and longest history of man and in punishment too there is so much of the festive seven entertaining as i do these thoughts i am let me say in parentheses fundamentally opposed to helping our pessimists to new water for the discordant and groaning mills of their disgust with life on the contrary it should be shown specifically that at the time when mankind was not yet ashamed of its cruelty life in the world was brighter than it is nowadays when there are pessimists the darkening of the heavens over man has always increased in proportion to the growth of man's shame before man the tired pessimistic outlook the mistrust of the riddle of life the icy negation of disgusted ennui all those are not the signs of the most evil age of the human race rather much do they come first to the light of day as the swamp flowers which they are when the swamp to which they belong comes into existence i mean the diseased refinement and moralization thanks to which the animal man has at last learned to be ashamed of all his instincts on the road to angelhood not to use in this context the harder word man has developed that dyspeptic stomach and coated tongue which have made not only the joy and innocence of the animal repulsive to him but also life itself so that sometimes he stands with stopped nostrils before his own self and like pope innocent the third makes a blacklist of his own horrors 
unclean generation, loathsome nutrition when in the maternal body, badness of the matter out of which man develops, awful stench, secretion of saliva, urine, and excrement. Nowadays, when suffering is always trotted out as the first argument against existence, as its most sinister query, it is well to remember the times when men judged on converse principles because they could not dispense with the infliction of suffering, and saw therein a magic of the first order, a veritable bait of seduction to life. Perhaps in those days, this is to solace the weaklings, pain did not hurt so much as it does nowadays. Any physician who has treated Negroes, granted that these are taken as representative of the prehistoric man, suffering from severe internal inflammations which would bring a European, even though he had the soundest constitution, almost to despair, would be in a position to come to this conclusion. Pain has not the same effect with Negroes. The curve of human sensibilities to pain seems indeed to sink in an extraordinary and almost sudden fashion. As soon as one has passed the upper ten thousand or ten millions of over-civilized humanity, and I personally have no doubt that by comparison with one painful night passed by one single hysterical chit of a cultured woman, the suffering of all the animals taken together who have been put to the question of the knife, so as to give scientific answers, are simply negligible. We may perhaps be allowed to admit the possibility of the craving for cruelty not necessarily having become really extinct. It only requires, in view of the fact that pain hurts more nowadays, a certain sublimation and subtilization. It must especially be translated into the imaginative and psychic plane, and be adorned with such smug euphemisms that even the most fastidious and hypocritical conscience can never grow suspicious of the real nature. Tragic pity is one of these euphemisms. Another is les nostalgies de la croix. What really raises one's indignation against suffering is not suffering intrinsically, but the senselessness of suffering. Such a senselessness, however, existed neither in Christianity, which interpreted suffering in a, into a whole mysterious salvation apparatus, nor in the beliefs of the naive ancient man, who only knew how to find a meaning in suffering from the standpoint of the spectator, or the inflictor of the suffering. In order to get the secret undiscovered, an unwitnessed suffering out of the world, it was almost compulsory to invent gods in a hierarchy of intermediate beings. In short, something which wanders even among secret places, sees even in the dark, and makes a point of never missing an interesting and painful spectacle. It was with the help of such inventions that life got to learn the tour de force, which has become part of its stock and trade, the tour de force of self-justification, of the justification of evil. Nowadays this would perhaps require other auxiliary devices. For instance, life is a riddle, life is a problem of knowledge. Every evil is justified in the sight of which a god finds edification. So rang the logic of primitive sentiment, and indeed, was it only of a primitive? The gods conceived as friends of spectacles of cruelty. Oh, how far does this primeval conception extend even nowadays into our European civilization? One would perhaps liken this context to consult Luther and Calvin. It is at any rate certain that even the Greeks knew no more piquant seasoning for their happiness of their gods than the joys of cruelty. What, do you think, was the mood with which Homer makes his gods look down upon the fates of men? What final meaning have at bottom the Trojan War and similar tragic horrors? It is impossible to entertain any doubt on the point. They were intended as festival games for the gods, and, in so far as the poet is of a more godlike breed than other man, as festival games also for the poets. It was in just this spirit and no other that at a later date the moral philosophers of Greece conceived the eyes of God as still looking down on the moral struggle, the heroism and the self-torture of the virtuous. The Heracles of duty was on a stage and was conscious of the fact. Virtue without witnesses was something quite unthinkable for this nation of actors. Must not that philosophical invention so audacious and so fatal, which was then absolutely new to Europe, the invention of free will, of the absolute spontaneity of man and good and evil, simply have been made for the specific purpose of justifying the idea that the interest of the gods and humanity and human virtue was inexhaustible? There would never on the stage of this free will world be a dearth of really new, really novel and exciting situations, plots, catastrophes. 
A world thought out on completely deterministic lines would be easily guessed by the gods, and would consequently soon bore them. Sufficient reason for these friends of the gods, the philosophers, not to ascribe to their gods such a deterministic world. The whole of ancient humanity is full of delicate consideration for the spectator, being as it is a world of thorough publicity and theatricality, which could not conceive of happiness without spectacles and festivals. And, as has already been said, even in great punishment, there is so much which is festive. 8. The feeling of ought, of personal obligation, to take up again the train of our inquiry, has had, as we saw, its origin in the oldest and most original personal relationship that there is, the relationship between buyer and seller, creditor and owner. Here it was that individual confronted individual, and that individual matched himself against individual. There has not yet been found a grade of civilization so low as not to manifest some trace of this relationship making prices, assessing values, thinking out equivalents, exchanging, all this preoccupied the primal thoughts of man to such an extent that in a certain sense it constituted thinking itself. It was here that was trained the oldest form of sagacity. It was here in this sphere that we can perhaps trace the first commencement of man's pride, of his feeling of superiority over other animals. Perhaps our word mensch, manas, still expresses just something of this self-pride man denoted himself as the being who measures values who values and measures as the assessing animal par excellence sale and purchase together with their psychological concomitants are older than the origins of any form of social organization and union it is rather from the most rudimentary form of individual right that the budding consciousness of exchange commerce debt right obligation compensation was first transferred to the rudest and most elementary of the social complexes in their relation to similar complexes the habit of comparing force with force together with that of measuring of calculating his eye was now focused to this perspective and with that ponderous consistency of characteristic of ancient thought which though set in motion with difficulty yet proceeds inflexibly along the line on which it has started Man soon arrived at the great generalization. Everything has its price. All can be paid for. The oldest and most naive moral canon of justice, the beginning of all kindness, of all equity, of all goodwill, of all objectivity in the world. Justice in this initial phase is the goodwill among people of about equal power to come to terms with each other, to come to an understanding again by means of a settlement, and with regard to the less powerful, to compel them to agree among themselves to a settlement. 9. Measured always by the standard of antiquity, this antiquity, moreover, is present or again possible at all periods, the community stands to its members in that important and radical relationship of creditors to his owners. Man lives in a community. Man enjoys the advantages of community. And what advantages? We occasionally underestimate them nowadays. Man lives protected, spared, in peace and trust, secure from certain injuries and enmities, to which the man outside the community, the peaceless man, is exposed. A German understands the original meaning of elend, secure because he has entered into pledges and obligations to the community in respect of these very injuries and enmities. What happens when this is not the case? The community, the defrauded creditor, will get itself paid as well as it can. One can reckon on that. In this case, the question of the direct damage done by the offender is quite subsidiary. Quite apart from this, the criminal is above all a breaker, a breaker of word and covenant to the whole, and regards all the advantages and amenities of the communal life in which up to that time he had participated. The criminal is an ower who not only fails to repay the advances and advantages that has been given to him, but even sets out to attack his creditor. Consequently, he is in the future not only as is fair, deprived of all these advantages and amenities, he is in addition reminded of the importance of those advantages. The wrath of the injured creditor of the community puts him back into the wild and outlawed status from which he has previously protected. The community repudiates him and now every kind of enmity can vent itself on him 
Punishment is in this stage of civilization simply the copy, the mimic, of the normal treatment of the hated, disdained, and conquered enemy, who is not only deprived of every right of, and protection, but of every mercy. So we have the martial law and triumphant festival of the Vevictus in all its mercilessness and cruelty. This shows why war itself, counting the sacrificial cult of war, has pronounced all the forms under which punishment was, has manifested itself in history. 10. As it grows more powerful, the community tends to take offenses of the individual less seriously, because they are now regarded as being much less revolutionary and dangerous to the corporate existence. The evildoer is no more outlawed and put outside the pale. The common wrath can no longer vent itself upon him with its old license. On the contrary, from this very time it is against this wrath, and particularly against the wrath of those directly injured, that the evildoer is carefully shielded and protected by the community. As, in fact, the penal law develops, the following characteristics become more and more clearly marked. Compromise with the wrath of those directly affected by the misdeed, a consequent endeavor to localize the matter and to prevent a further, or indeed a general spread of the disturbance. Attempts to find equivalents and to settle the whole matter, compositio, above all the will which manifests itself with increasing definiteness to treat every offence as in a certain degree capable of being paid off and consequently at any rate up to a certain point to isolate the offender from his act as the power and the self-consciousness of a community increases so proportionately does the penal law become mitigated conversely every weakening and jeopardizing of the community revives the harshest forms of that law the creditor has always grown more humane proportionately as he has grown more rich finally the amount of injury he can endure without really suffering becomes the criterion of his wealth it is possible to conceive of a society blessed with so great a consciousness of its own power as to indulge in the most aristocratic luxury of letting its wrongdoers go scot-free what do my parasites matter to me might society say let them live and flourish i am strong enough for it the justice which began with the maxim everything can be paid off everything must be paid off ends with the connivance at the escape of those who cannot pay to escape it ends like every good thing on earth by destroying itself this self-destruction of justice we know the pretty name it calls itself grace it remains as is obvious the privilege of the strongest better still their super law 11. A deprecatory word here against the attempts that have lately been made to find the origin of justice on quite another basis, namely on that of resentment. Let me whisper a word in the ear of the psychologists if they would fain study revenge itself at close quarters. This plant blooms its prettiest at present among anarchists and anti-Semites, a hidden flower, as it has ever been like violet, though forsooth with another perfume and as like must necessarily emanate from like it will not be a matter for surprise that it is just in such circles that we see the birth of endeavors it is their old birthplace compare above first essay paragraph fourteen to sanctify revenge under the name of justice as though justice were at bottom merely a development of the consciousness of injury and thus with the rehabilitation of revenge to reinstate generally and collectively all the reactive emotions i object to this last point least of all it even seems meritorious when regarded from the standpoint of the whole problem of biology from which standpoint the value of these emotions has up to the present been underestimated and that to which i alone call attention is the circumstance that it is the spirit of revenge itself from which develops this new nuance of scientific equity for the benefit of hate envy mistrust jealousy suspicion rancor revenge the scientific equity stops immediately and makes way for the accents of deadly enmity and prejudice so soon as another group of emotions comes on the scene which in my opinion are of a much higher biological value than these reactions and consequently have a paramount claim to the valuation and appreciation of science i mean the really active emotions such as personal and material ambition and so forth e during value of life course of philosophy and passim 
so much against this tendency in general but as for the particular maxim of durings that the home of justice is to be found in the sphere of the reactive feelings our love of truth compels us drastically to invert his own proposition and to oppose to him this other maxim the last sphere conquered by the spirit of justice is the sphere of the feeling of reaction when it really comes about that the just man remains just even as regards his injurer and not merely cold moderate reserved indifferent being just is always a positive state when in spite of the strong provocation of personal insult contempt and calumny the lofty and clear objectivity of the just and judging eye whose glance is as profound as it is gentle is untroubled why then we have a piece of perfection a past master of the world something in fact which it would not be wise to expect and which should not at any rate be too easily believed speaking generally there is no doubt but that even the justest individual only requires a little dose of hostility malice or innuendo to drive the blood into his brain and the fairness from it the active man the attacking aggressive man is always a hundred degrees nearer to justice than the man who merely reacts he certainly has no need to adopt the tactics necessary in the case of the reacting man of making false and biased valuations of his object it is in point of fact for this reason that the aggressive man has at all times enjoyed the stronger bolder more aristocratic and also freer outlook the better conscience on the other hand we already surmise who it really is that has on his conscience the invention of the bad conscience the resentful man finally let man look at himself in history in what sphere up to the present has the whole administration of law the actual need of law found its earthly home perchance in the sphere of the reacting man not for a minute rather in that of the active strong spontaneous aggressive man i deliberately defy the above-mentioned agitator who himself makes this self-confession the creed of revenge has run through all my works and endeavors like the red thread of justice and say that judged historically law in the world represents the very war against the reactive feelings the very war waged on those feelings by the powers of activity and aggression which devote some of their strength to damning and keeping within bounds this effervescence of hysterical reactivity and to forcing it to some compromise everywhere where justice is practiced and justice is maintained it is to be observed that the stronger power when confronted with the weaker powers which are inferior to it whether they be groups or individuals searches for weapons to put an end to the senseless fury of resentment while it carries on its object partly by taking the victim of resentment out of the clutches of revenge partly by substituting for revenge a campaign of its own against the enemies of peace and order partly by finding suggesting and occasionally enforcing settlements partly by standardizing certain equivalents for injuries to which equivalents the element of resentment is henceforth finally referred the most drastic measure however taken and effectuated by the supreme power to combat the preponderance of the feelings of spite and vindictiveness it takes this measure as soon as it is at all strong enough to do so is the foundation of law the imperative declaration of what in its eyes is to be regarded as just and lawful and what unjust and unlawful and while after the foundation of law the supreme power treats the aggressive and arbitrary acts of individuals or of whole groups as a violation of law and a revolt against itself it distracts the feelings of its subjects from the immediate injury inflicted by such a violation and thus eventually attains the very opposite result to that always desired by revenge which sees and recognizes nothing but the standpoint of the injured party from henceforth the eye becomes trained to a more and more impersonal valuation of the deed even the eye of the injured party himself though this is the in the final stage of all as has been previously remarked on this principle right and wrong first manifest themselves after the foundation of law and not as during maintains only after the act of violation to talk of intrinsic right and intrinsic wrong is absolutely nonsensical intrinsically as an injury an oppression an exploitation an annihilation can be nothing wrong inasmuch as life is essentially 
that is in its cardinal functions something which functions by injuring oppressing exploiting and annihilating and is absolutely inconceivable without such a character it is necessary to make an even more serious confession viewed from the most advanced biological standpoint conditions of legality can be only exceptional conditions in that they are partial restrictions of the real life will which makes for power and in that they are subordinated to the life will's general end as particular means that is as means to create larger units of strength a legal organization conceived of as sovereign and universal not as a weapon in a fight for complexes of power but as a weapon against fighting generally something after the style of during's communistic model of treating every will as equal with every other will would be a principle hostile to life a destroyer and dissolver of man an outrage on the future of man a symptom of fatigue a secret cut to nothingness twelve a word more on the origin and end of punishment two problems which are or ought to be kept distinct but which unfortunately are usually lumped into one and what tactics have our moral genealogists employed up to the present in these cases their inveterate naivete they find out some end in the punishment for instance revenge and deterrence and then in all their innocence set this end at the beginning as the causa fiende of the punishment and they have done the trick but the patching up of a history of the origin of law is the last use to which the end of law ought to be put perhaps there is no more pregnant principle for any kind of history than the following which difficult though it is to master should none the less be mastered in every detail the origin of the existence of a thing and its final utility its practical application and incorporation in a system of ends are toto calo opposed to each other everything anything which exists and which prevails anywhere will always be put to new purposes by a force superior to itself will be commandeered afresh will be turned and transformed to new uses all happening in the organic world consists of overpowering and dominating and again all overpowering and domination is a new interpretation and adjustment which must necessarily obscure or absolutely extinguish the subsisting meaning and end the most perfect comprehension of the utility of any physiological organ or also of a legal institution social custom political habit form and art or in religious worship does not for a minute imply any simultaneous comprehension of its origin this may seem uncomfortable and unpalatable to the older men for it has been the immemorial belief that understanding the final cause or the utility of a thing and form and an institution means also understanding the reason for its origin to give an example of this logic the eye was made to see the hand was made to grasp so even punishment was conceived as invented with a view to punishing but all ends and all utilities are only signs that a will to power has mastered a less powerful force has impressed thereon out of its own self the meaning of a function and the whole history of a thing an organ a custom can on the same principle be regarded as a continuous sign chain of perpetually new interpretations and adjustments whose causes so far from needing to have even a mutual connection sometimes follow and alternate with each other absolutely haphazard similarly the evolution of a thing of a custom is anything but its progressus to an end still less a logical and direct progressus attained with the minimum expenditure of energy and cost it is rather the succession of processes of subjugation more or less profound more or less mutually independent which operate on the thing itself it is further the resistance which in each case invariably displayed the subjugation the protean wriggles by way of defense and reaction and further the results of successful counter efforts the form is fluid but the meaning is even more so even inside every individual organism the case is the same with every genuine growth of the whole the function of individual organs becomes shifted in certain cases a partial perishing of these organs a diminution of their numbers for instance through annihilation of the connecting members can be a symptom of growing strength and perfection what i mean is this even partial loss of utility decay and degeneration loss of function and purpose in a word death 
appertain to the conditions of a genuine progressus which always appears in the shape of a will and way to greater power and is always realized at the expense of innumerable smaller powers the magnitude of a progress is gauged by the greatness of the sacrifice that it requires humanity is a mass sacrificed to the prosperity of the one stronger species of man that would be a progress i emphasize all the more this cardinal characteristic of the historic method for the reason that in its essence it runs counter to predominant instincts and prevailing taste which must prefer to put up with absolute casualness even with the mechanical senselessness of all phenomena then with the theory of a power will an exhaustive play throughout all phenomena the democratic idiosyncrasy against everything which rules and wishes to rule the modern misarchism to coin a bad word for a bad thing has gradually but so thoroughly transformed itself into the guise of intellectualism the most abstract intellectualism that even nowadays it penetrates and has the right to penetrate step by step into the most exact and apparently the most objective sciences this tendency has in fact in my view already dominated the whole of physiology and biology and to their detriment as is obvious in so far as it has spirited away a radical idea the idea of true activity the tyranny of this idiosyncrasy however results in the theory of adaptation being pushed forward into the van of the argument exploited adaptation that means to say a second-class activity a mere capacity for reacting in fact life itself has been defined by herbert spencer as an increasingly effective internal adaptation to external circumstances this definition however fails to realize the real essence of life its will to power it fails to appreciate the paramount superiority enjoyed by those plastic forces of spontaneity aggression and encroachment with their new interpretations and tendencies to the operation of which adaptation is only a natural corollary consequently the sovereign office of the highest functionaries in the organism itself among which the life will appears as an active and formative principle is repudiated one remembers huxley's reproach to spencer of his administrative nihilism but it is a case of something much more than administration end of section three recording by geoffrey church